Something we noticed recently at Classics World is growing interest in modern classic estate cars. And here we've got two perfect examples of the breed. We've got the evergreen Volvo 240, which everyone will remember from their childhood probably. It ran right from the, from the 70s right up until the 90s, until 93 they made the last ones. And here we have a 93 example of the Ford Granada Scorpio estate. We're down at Stone Cold Classics here in Kent, where they specialise in finding super mint examples of cars just like this. So, we've got the old style Volvo and the rather newer Ford. How do they compare? If you ask someone to think about classic Volvos, the first image that's probably going to come to mind is going to be an Amazon or one of these, the 240. And if, like me, you grew up in the 70s, then this is what comes to mind when someone mentions Volvo, really. No matter how much Scandi chic the new models have and how much they're driving towards the electrification and high tech, to me, an older Volvo is one of these, a big boxy 240 estate. And they're a great car. They've got a great unburstable sort of feel to them. And it's not quite a Mercedes, but it just feels like it'll truck on and on and on forever. And these things are really built solid. They're built to withstand the Swedish winter, of course, but they were popular all over the world, and especially in countries like Canada. They even built Volvos in Canada for quite a while. In Nova Scotia, they had a factory in Halifax. It was while driving a Volvo in Canada that I spanned one of these on a dirt road, which is my Volvo claim to fame. And I can tell you, they're not the most sporting drive, are they? And once it starts to go, there's no getting it back. The steering isn't that quick. But that's missing the point, isn't it? It's not a sporting car, this Volvo. It's a car of quiet quality. It goes well enough, it's quite refined, and it just gives the feeling that it's never gonna quite let you down. And even, even when it's in its old, old age, it's just gonna be a little bit shabby. It's never actually gonna expire. There's a reason why Volvo had the uh, high mileage club, and why the highest mileage car in the world is indeed a Volvo. It's the estate model like this that really gave Volvo its place in the market, especially in Britain. It was always associated with antique dealers, and then latterly as the cars became cheaper it was a cut price builder's van or a painter and decorator's van. But these made great family cars as well, and this one's actually got seven seats, and that was quite a common thing with these Volvo estates. Back in the day before the SUV crowded out every other type of car, if you wanted seven seats in an everyday vehicle, you didn't want to buy a minibus, then Volvo Estate was the ideal thing. You've got two little flip-up jump seats in the boot, but you could stick the family in there with some safety too. You've even got a seat belt. If you specified the extra jump seats in the boot, the estate models came with a reinforced rear end, so the crumple zones in, in the rear were reinforced to give you some safety. Of course, the world has changed these days. Every car you get in has got a premium feel to the interior, but it's important to remember that back when these cars were current, this sort of interior quality was way ahead of something like a, a Ford or a Vauxhall. The quality of the interior on this one, I'd say, is about level with, say, an E30 BMW, something like that. It, do, it does feel like it's not going to come apart in your hands, that's for certain. I don't know where Stone Cold find cars like this, it's 36 years old, this thing, and it's absolutely mint. I mean, the seats are mint, the paintwork's mint, <laughs> everything's like new. I can't remember the last time I sat in a Volvo 240 that was this clean. The Volvos of this age have always got a really long gear shift. It's quite positive, but it's, it feels quite a uh, sort of long shift. But everything about it feels sort of chunky and heavy duty. Volvo really got their money's worth out of the 240. It lasted them for absolutely years. It was launched in the 70s and it lasted right until 93. But even then, it was in fact developed from the previous model, the 140. Indeed, from the windscreen backwards, these cars are pretty much just an evolution of the 140. It was just the front end that was different with its McPherson struts and the new B-series engines. The car's full of quirky little touches that used to identify the Scandinavian cars, the Saabs and the Volvos. If you open the door, there's a buzzer goes off. If you even try and drive away without your seatbelt on, a buzzer starts going. And of course, you've got the lights on all the time. The uh, Volvos were one of the first cars to have the daylight running lights. We've got the 2-litre B-series here. So it's around 100 horsepower, but it's, it's fine. The cars aren't as heavy as they look, even though they look like a big, chunky beast. They're, they're not a huge heavyweight car, and it drives really nicely. It's definitely no sports car, this. It was invented a long time before the idea of a performance estate car. It really doesn't feel like it wants to be hurried. It's not a high revving engine or anything like that. But having said that, it's, it's quite smooth. It has a sort of fan-like sound as you rev it but it gets along the road quite well. It's, it's not quite as precise as a modern Volvo, perhaps, but um, it's certainly good enough to keep up with modern traffic. Volvo was unusual in that it persisted for ages with an overdrive box, with a, a four-speed overdrive with a gear top mounted switch to engage the overdrive. This car, being a later model, has the five-speed box, which does make it feel that little bit more modern. It's funny, really, I've been driving this car for quite a while now, and I've forgotten just how old it is. They might have seemed a little bit old-fashioned back in the day, but driving one today, it doesn't feel 
any more old fashioned. It just feels like a Volvo. This is also about the most practical classic car you could ever buy. The boot is absolutely massive and you've got those extra seats as well. You could drive it all day without getting tired. It's not too bad on fuel. It's an ideal modern classic really. So here we are in the Mark III Granada estate, which you could have bought at the same time as you could have wandered into a Volvo showroom and bought a 240 estate. They couldn't be more different though in many ways. After all, the Volvo was already a very old design by 93 when they stopped making them. Whereas this was launched in 85 originally as a hatchback. They added an estate in 92, but it was still a fresh new design. If it looks a little bit like a Sierra, well, that's because it is. The Mark III Granada was basically a stretched version of the Sierra floor pan. And Ford had the idea that it would straddle two different segments of the market. Believe it or not, they were really considering that they had a premium competitor to the likes of BMW and Mercedes. So you're talking 5 Series and E-Class, really. The era that produced this car was a funny time for Ford. They were just getting their act back together after being roundly slated for the Mark V Escort. It would only be a couple of years after this car was made that Ford would release the Mondeo, which obviously changed our opinion of Ford's, certainly as driver's cars, pretty much forever. You could have ordered your Mark III Granada with anything from a four-cylinder Pinto engine right up to the Cologne V6, which was offered in 2.9 litre flavour. Of course, in comparison to engines from BMW and Mercedes, the Cologne V6 was quite old-fashioned. After all, it's a pushrod V6. The Cosworth engine got twin overhead cams, but this is just the regular 2.9. But it's fine. With fuel injection, I think it makes about 145 horsepower. It feels quite nice. It's a nice torquey unit, and it feels like it's suited to the car. What we've got here is the absolute range top of the Scorpio, which gives you leather, trip computer, electric everything, we've got air conditioning, and we've even got a marvellous uh, twin deck Ford uh, audio kit here. We've got cassette and single slot CD. In 92, that was quite something. Just like the Volvo, this is a big estate car in the old school style. Before estates went all lifestyle-y and sloping, but it's not quite as big as the Volvo. That really is massive. It's still a useful wagon though, this thing. You're gonna get big dogs in the back. You're gonna get all your holiday gear, everything you might wanna to take to a car show. You're certainly not gonna be running out of space. You just don't have the seven seats. On the road, the Granada definitely feels more modern than the Volvo. It's a lot less busy at speed. It's got independent suspension all around, so it doesn't have that wiggle at the back over the rough surfaces. And it just generally uh, shows its age or lack of age. It does feel really quite modern. Of course, these days, Ford don't sell big estate cars or even big saloon cars. They've left that market entirely and, well, if they couldn't win, they didn't want to play. It's a shame, really, because this shows that when they put their mind to it, Ford really could build a, a very credible contender in the executive saloon market. It's a real one-fingered special, this. It's got light steering, automatic box. It's ever so easy. You can see why so many ended up as taxis. That and the fact that they did last pretty well. Perhaps not as well as the Volvo, but by Ford standards, these Granadas were long-lived. It's not the ultimate driving machine, that's for sure, but it is the ultimate cruising machine, I think. So I've taken both of these for a drive, got to come up with a verdict. Well, the first thing I'd say is that it's incredible that you could buy both of these cars, in theory, in the same year, in 1993. The Ford feels so much more modern, the Volvo more of a classic. But which one would you choose as a classic? Well, I don't know. The Volvo has got that lovely old Volvo feel and there's nothing quite like that. The Ford is excellent and it reminds you of just how good Ford can be on a good day. But the Ford is that good that it still feels really quite modern and it feels in many ways just like driving a newish car. So I would go for the Volvo as a classic. It's got a lovely feel to it and it's a sort of car you just don't find anymore yet it is still a very usable and very practical classic. I mean it is about the most practical car you can buy, classic or not. So I'd be going home in the Volvo but I'd always be wondering whether I should have chosen the Ford I think. 